the Springer Spaniel is for many the ultimate rough shooter's dog. If correctly trained, it has no equal at hunting, flushing and retrieving. But these quicksilver, nimble little dogs can be temperamentally a challenge and in their training there are no shortcuts. Once you've made the decision that you want to buy a Springer Spaniel puppy, you will have looked at the dogs for sale column in the shooting press and the local newspaper, made an appointment and gone to see the puppies. When you arrive, the first thing you look at is the condition of the premises. Are they run down? Are they smart? Are they clean? Do they reflect the sort of quality of standard that you want in your dog? If I arrived at a dirty, run-down place, I would not waste my time and bother looking at the dogs. I always think that the standard of the premises reflects the quality of what I'm going to see. Having accepted that the place is what I want to look at, the first thing I would ask for is sight of the pedigree. And this pedigree here tells me that what I'm going to be seeing are puppies of excellent potential. Lots of red in the great-great-grandparents denoting field trials champions. At the parent end, field trials winners and one or two champions, this tells me the dogs will be of excellent working stock, but not too hot. The average weekend shooter does not want a dog which has got so many field trials champions in its recent pedigree that the dog is likely to be very quick. Basically, if you want to buy a Land Rover, you don't want to end up with a Ferrari. Once you've looked at the pedigree, and it's got several FTCHs, which denote field trials champions, normally written in red, and you're happy with that, then you look at the puppies. Now, it makes as much sense to look at a family of puppies. In this case, I'm going to look at six. It makes as much sense to look at these puppies and wonder which one will be a field trials champion as it does to look at six children and wonder which one will be a brain surgeon and which one will be unemployable. You cannot, at this age, tell their future potential beyond the pedigree. What you can choose, however, is coloration and confirmation. And I'm going to look for the puppy that suits me and the one that I feel I'll take home. Hello, Katie. Hello, Katie. Hello, what a pretty girl you are. What a pretty girl. When you first go into a kennel with a strange bitch and puppies, Go in quietly, don't rush toward them, and let the bitch come and see who you are. Now, it's very warm weather today, and these puppies are full of food and sleeping. If they were cooler and perhaps hungry, they'd be dashing about, and that would, in fact, make it easier to make your selection. I would normally pick the cheeky one that came to me. But since they're all sound asleep in a bundle, what I'm going to do is pick through them and have a look for the one that I think I want to take a closer look at. I'm hopefully going to find a dog that I want, although if I found a perfect bitch, I would have her. That one I've just lifted out has got a touch too much white in it for my liking. What have we got here? You're a fine looking thing, a little bitch. What a beauty. This little liver and white pup here stands out in that she hasn't got the body bulk of her brothers and sisters. She's smaller than the rest. It doesn't mean that she's not going to be a healthy adult, but it's not the one I would choose. 
Anyway, it's a bitch. This space here. <laughs> you look hopeful. I wonder what you are. Come on, out we come. Let's have you. Let's have you. And you're a dog. What I'm looking for is a nice, plump body of the right length and shape, thick, straight limbs, a nice round head, clear, well-set eyes, and a correct scissor bite. What I mean by a correct scissor bite is that the, I'll put you down, that the teeth meet with the upper teeth very slightly over the lower jaw. If the upper jaw was overshot, it would protrude like so, and if it was undershot, the lower jaw would stick out like that. And that is a genetic problem. And I wouldn't take a puppy under or overshot in a gift. It would not only have bite problems, gripping problems in its later working life, but it is a genetic fault. And you'd never be able to use the dog for breeding. From what I've seen, the one that I want is the one I picked. And it's you. The correct way to pick up a puppy is never carry it about by the scruff, but to sit it with its hind legs over either side of your forearm, two or three fingers on its chest. And in this way, the dog's soft tissues in its stomach here and its diaphragm are not put under any stress whatsoever. The dog is secure, happy and comfortable, and I can't drop it. You're a wee beauty. I hope that in the months and years to come, my expectations are lived up to. When you've set out to buy a puppy, the wise man prepares for the fact that he may well be bringing one home with him. Now, if you've gone with someone else, you can put the dog in a cardboard box in the front seat between the passenger's feet, and they, they can look after the puppy and give it comfort. If you're on your own, take a cardboard box. In my case, I have a metal box. Line whichever receptacle you're taking with paper, because it's likely that a puppy in its first car journey will either be sick or make a mess. What you don't want the dog to do is to arrive there covered in its own mess. If you've filled it with newspaper, as I have done, then that's going to absorb any liquid. In we pop. There's a good little fellow. And remember, when you're driving home, you mustn't be driving like you're in a rally, with the puppy getting fired round the back like a shuttle cock. Here, even at this stage in its life, don't introduce it to a car journey as something that is traumatic. Take care, drive carefully, and hopefully you'll arrive back with the puppy as happy as it was when you set off. When you're taking your new puppy home, it is a good idea if you've made preparation for bringing it to the house so you don't arrive home with a dog and tell your wife you're now the owners of a new puppy. Prepare for its arrival. Have a bed area made up if you're going to keep it indoors in an area where it's not going to urinate on a carpet. A wash house next to a kitchen is ideal, but it should be somewhere where the dog can feel secure and comfortable out of drafts and generally unable to do any damage as it starts to nibble with its teeth. Now this little dog, I'm going to have it at night because this is the summer, sleeping in this box inside 
a big kennel. And then, as it grows that little bit older, I'll take this box away and it will sleep in a normal kennel run in a sleeping box at night. But for now, it's lovely weather. I'm going to put it in a lawn run. Come on, pup. A question that the gun dog owner often asks himself is what is the most appropriate kennel design for his needs? Obviously, much depends on the size of the yard available, whether the run can be large or must be small. This kennel here, a proprietary design of wood and weld mesh, has a very restrictive run and has the disadvantage that the skirting, which comes so high, makes it that if the dog wants to see out, it must stand on its hind legs. And that's something that you want to discourage. The good thing with this kennel design is that the sleeping box has a raised sleeping platform round the corner away from the door and that cuts down the likelihood of drafts. This kennel is sitting on a concrete base with a two inch lip round it and the floor has a run from the top to a drain in that corner and it means that washing water poured in here would automatically flush the floor across and down the drain. A kennel design, in my opinion, which is infinitely better, much more practical, hello honey, is this kennel here. Of box section and chain link, six foot six to seven feet high, this kennel would prevent even the ultimate canine escapologist from getting out. It has in this corner one weak link. The lid of the sleeping box which is used as a day bed, is a short hop out and away if a dog wanted to jump. So therefore, if you had a dog in here that was likely to want to escape, you would put wire over that corner and that would prevent that happening. Hygiene in a kennel is of vital importance. And again here, the floor, which is two meters by three meters, is concrete. It has a six inch lip and it has a run that takes it to a central drain there. Any urine or indeed washing water here automatically flows away and down the drain. The sleeping box, which is one meter by one meter and sufficiently high to allow a dog to stand up without being hunched, has the door offset and raised off the floor and this means that it cuts down again the possibility of drafts. A box this size is sufficiently large for one dog to sleep happily in hot summer weather and in the coldest winter nights this box would easily accommodate up to five spaniels all cuddled in together with lots of heat transference. Hygiene of course in the box is equally important and so therefore the lid should be made that it lifts off. It has insulation here so that in the winter the hot air rising doesn't get away and in the summer of course you just wedge it up to let the hot air out. But you can easily wash in there and keep any vermin to a minimum. Again dogs like to chew so the box has on every edge that is likely to have inquisitive teeth this lining of heavy duty aluminium that keeps the box from being destroyed. A disadvantage of the concrete floor is that if the dog is not out on a regular basis, it could wear down its pads or its claws. And so therefore, I would always have a dog in a run during the day if that was possible, although this would do at a pinch if it was necessary. But what you must remember, that whatever kennel design you choose, Hygiene should be your first priority. Progressively, over your young dog's formative months, it is important that you take it out into the environment, let it experience all the new sights and the smells that are potentially frightening for the young dog. What you're doing is building the confidence you're manning it, laying the foundation that for years to come will be 
what the dog works from. It means that if the dog, when it's young and it finds something frightening, will automatically run back to you because you are the source of comfort. You are the, the pack leader. And whilst you haven't at this early stage, sit, good, up. At this early stage, started to really teach you to sit. Whenever you have an occasion, gently pushing it into a sitting position, laying the foundation of the dog, going into a sitting position. If it stands up, it doesn't matter. We're not trying to frighten it. Now, Jess here has never experienced water. So what I've done today, I've picked a warm day. The water temperature is high. I've brought my Labrador, and I'm going to try and encourage her into the water, her first introduction to water. I don't expect her to jump in and swim off like a seal. If that happened, it would be a bonus. What I do expect is to get her feet wet. I might manage to tempt her in just by her seeing the older dog. What you mustn't do, ever, is try and force the dog. It must never be a frightening experience. If the water was very cold, if I'd picked the middle of winter, and then I put her in there and she did go in, what's likely to happen is the water temperature gives such a shock, she thinks, oh, I'm not doing that anymore, that wasn't pleasant. Then you've got weeks of work to try and get her in and, and introduce her. But doing it this way, with any luck, keeping her on the lead, trying to keep her enthusiasm, it should work. Honey, get in. What do you think of that? At this age, you don't want to retrieve. You want her in. Because if I was to throw a dummy for her and she picked it, she wouldn't bring it back to me anyway. And then I would have, have another problem. She'd be running off with the dummy. All I want to try and do is get her wet. A good girl. Look at this one. Let's see. Now, if this works, we're in business. She's obviously getting excited. What a good girl. Now, she can't swim so well. She's, her bottom end is going down. She's splashing. Good girl. Honey, go in beside her. Get on. Get on. Good girl, Jess. Good girl. What she's got to learn to do is to relax and let her bottom come up. Good girl. What a good girl. And obviously make a big fuss. Good girl. Here. What a good girl. Was that enough for today, or do you want to try it once more? Big stone? Wonderful. She'll never look back. An introduction to water can be as easy as that. Good girl, don't panic. Go in beside her. Get on. Now she's going to go and try and pick a stick. Come on, good girl. I think we'll give her a... Enough for today. Come on, back on the lead. There they are. Now, here's a girl. Now, what is important? Don't you shake. Don't shake. What is important is constantly make a fuss. Life is a wonderful experience for a little dog like this. You must keep it like that. Make a fuss of her. Try hopping again. Hop. There's a lovely little girl. Over your young dog's formative months, you constantly assess its capabilities, its natural aptitude to do the sort of work that you want it to do. Today is the, the very day when I've had a feeling from this little dog that she's ready to do something for me, that she, and sit up, so good girl, up. She wants to work. She's just gone into the water in such a beautiful fashion that I've taken Honey back to the kennel and I'm going to try and teach this little dog to sit and let me get some distance from it. Up, up, sit, 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 sit. Good girl, up there. Up, 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 up. 
don't push your luck. Don't try and get too far away from the dog too soon. Go back, up, up, up. Don't crowd over the dog. Up's a good girl, good girl. Up's a good girl. Up, 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 The idea is the dog should get used up to space between you and it. Never use silly words like stay. Up. The command to sit or to up means literally that. It doesn't mean sit for five minutes, one minute, half an hour. It means sit till I tell you to move. Up. Good girl. So therefore, you know, the use of the word stay is meaningless. The dog should have the idea, up, up, good, you know, up. She should have the idea that when you put her down, she should stay there. And until she has learnt that perfectly, you should not move on to ever recalling her in. Leave her sitting, move about slowly, keep within sufficient distance that you can go back to her and check her if she moves. Never mind that she lies down. Up, up. Never mind that she lies down. Just go through it gently. Keep her confidence, keep her interest. Her tail's wagging. Good girl, good girl, good girl. Her tail's wagging, and so therefore she's not afraid. Shall we try it once more? You wouldn't move on to the recall until she had this lesson firmly bedded into her head. No, no, no. Up, 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 up. Now you'll notice. I'm leaving the lead on her at this stage. Up. It means that if she does break, there's basically a handle I can catch. Good girl. I've got three meters away from her. On her first up lesson, that's sufficient. I'm not going to push my luck. A lovely little girl. That will do you for today. Come on. Good girl. Here we see Mike going through the long process of progressively making the dog sit at ever increasing distances. The whole idea is to constantly put greater distance between yourself and the dog as the lesson progresses over the months. And in these early months, nine times out of ten return to the dog only occasionally would you ever call the dog to you.
Good girl. Good girl. Girl. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. With this hard-going young dog, the lesson starts off again with short distances between the dog and the handler. Firmly lift him into place if he either tries to lie down or come to you before being called. Dog. Up, up, up. No need to hit him. Up. Just be firm but gentle. Up. 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 Come in. Come in. Then recall him and make a fuss when you are ready. When you move on, put the dog on the lead to keep him under control. Then repeat the exercise. By constantly giving both visual up. and verbal commands, you are teaching him two up. commands simultaneously. Up. The whole idea of returning to the dog up. is to get the notion into his head that he must up. not move until given the command. Come in. Henry, come in. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Visit any gun shop and you're likely to be shown a wide variety of dog whistles, ranging from the expensive to the cheap. My advice on the choice of a dog whistle is that, like all other aspects of gun dog training, you keep it simple. My personal choice of a dog whistle is a little buffalo horn one. This one is plastic. They both share the same tone, which is a little peep, perfectly suitable to communicate with a dog in any likely distance you're going to work it. What you don't want to do is to have the multi-toned whistles. What you must also remember is that a whistle with a P in it is liable to alter tone. And a whistle should be simple. It's purely a method of you communicating with your dog and saving your voice and preventing you having to shout around the countryside. Remember, the skill with dog whistles and dog work is that it should be played down. Never do you want to be one of these fellows in the shooting field who shouts and roars at his dog, blows his whistle like it's the trumpet voluntary, if you've got to do that, either your dog has something seriously wrong with its hearing, or your training has all gone to bits. Let's watch Mike Thomas working with his dog and a whistle.
the theory of teaching whistle control is that the dog comes to you by the visual command it has now come to associate with recall and it drops to the hand signal which you have taught it for hup. It would be fair to say that before your young dog is totally reliable on the stop whistle, it would be unwise to move on to any other aspect of his training. Good little dog. and give him a pat. It reassures him, makes him feel good, and lets him know that you like him. <laughs> he is keen on that rabbit burrow. Remember, you are building confidence in the dog. It must have the security of knowing that you are not going to leave him behind as he learns to work with you as part of a team. always make a fuss. Get on. Get on. Once your young dog is reliable on both sitting and recall and has a broad base of discipline responding well to the whistle Good is girl. when you can start Good to girl. teach it general whistle control and build in early quartering. By walking across ground you have already cleared of game in a zigzag course, constantly waving the dog on and Good giving girl. two toots as you turn away, the dog will quickly learn to turn on the whistle. And of course, you do have the confidence of knowing you can stop the dog with Good the girl. whistle if things start Good to go girl. wrong. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl.
All dog training is a progression of lessons, each one building on the strength of the other. The introduction and steadiness to dummy whilst sitting can only be achieved when all previous lessons are firmly in the dog's head. And if he moves, immediately and firmly put it back in its place. Steadiness to the dummy means that the dog must grow to understand that anything flying through the air or bouncing along the ground, no matter how tempting, must be ignored and should only be retrieved as a privilege on command. Always finish with one retrieve yourself. This enforces discipline. The progressive introduction of more hand signals as the dog becomes familiar with reading your body language can be built into the lesson of steadiness to the dummy whilst the dog is in motion. This, of course, is where the real control with your dog starts to blend together. And again, one retrieve per training session is all that you should allow the dog.
and get one yourself. When you start to introduce hand signals to your young dog, it must be remembered that dogs are short-sighted. Therefore, you're always going to strive to give the dog a silhouette and never be tempted to do these strange tic-tac things that some people seem to think works at long distance. The technique is simple. You start your dog off sitting when it is properly trained to sit and not move. You throw a dummy to one side and you give it a very obvious hand signal to go to that side. Take the retrieve and on the next occasion you throw the dummy to the right, a very obvious hand signal to the right. In this way, the dog gets used to seeing this form of silhouette. To make the dog sit at distance, it's straight up in the air. Not that, because in silhouette the dog can see nothing and at long distance all the dog would see would be your outline. That is to sit, that is for right, and that is for left. If you want the dog to come to you, a hand motion you can incorporate patting your thigh and the sound will help the dog. But again, it should be a big motion. And to send the dog straight away from you, it is back. And a combination of that movement and the word back will teach the dog to go straight from you. Let's watch Mike working with hand signals and a young dog. Here. With a young dog that is now fully under control Here. and responding to hand and whistle, but has not at any time encountered game live or dead, now you can take it in to the controlled conditions of the game pen. Be ever ready to stop the dog if it goes wrong.
you. It is vital that you work close to the dog, ready to prevent him from chasing and keep his attention, walking him through the game, discouraging any temptation that might be to chase. Give your dog one retrieve of a furred or feathered dummy and then work him carefully beside you. Whilst the dog has the instinct in him to chase, if he has never experienced it, you will find it easier to keep him under control. But be ever vigilant if he tries to break after the game. Yeah. Stop him with the whistle and redirect him or call him to heel. Finally, leaving him in a sitting position, Come in. call him to you through the game. Quartering has been gently taught to your young dog up until this stage in his training, but now you can progress to a greater working range. Pick an area where you have previously walked the game off the ground, but it should still have plenty of scent. This will encourage the dog to work. But remember to be constantly vigilant, to stop the dog from pulling forward in front of you, as this young dog is tempted to do. It is much more desirable to have the dog working from side to side than pulling out in front. So you must be particularly careful not to allow this. If you feel that he is going wrong, either change direction or make him sit, then recall him. Obviously, you must keep your young dog's interest in work, and as he has settled down into a better quartering pattern since he has run off his initial steam, it is permissible to give him a retrieve.
When you throw out a split retrieve, remember it is necessary to discipline yourself always to send the dog for the first retrieve you throw, since the last one you throw will be the most immediate in his mind and the one he will naturally want to go for first. A little delay, walk him on, then send him for the other. Introduction to shot is something which should always be taken seriously. Never assume that because your young dog is well bred from working stock, that when you come out with this potentially frightening long stick that suddenly explodes, that it will mean nothing to the dog. It must always be assumed that the dog may be afraid. Too many excellent dogs have been spoilt by silly owners making assumptions that the dog has never lived up to. The proper way to do it is to have someone, in this case Mike, is standing a hundred yards behind me and he's holding a 410. We will then graduate onto a 12 bore and if you don't have a 410 or a starting pistol then use a 12 bore but start a little bit further away and progressively work in as the shots get louder, watch the dog, stay with the dog and if it shows the slightest fear then you're here to comfort it, and if the dog is really afraid, immediately stop the lesson and do it on another occasion. Watch this. Watch this. There we are. What was that? At that range, the gun is just a pop. It gets the dog's attention. She's wondering what's going on, and there's certainly no fear. What's that? I hope you hear lots and lots and lots of those noises in years to come. Again, Mike. Oh, oh. bang, bang, bang. You'll notice I've still got the dog on the rope. In case it tried to run away, I can restrain it. But this little dog, I can already tell you, is never going to be afraid. Because we have introduced it gently. Come right up here, please, Mike. Oh, oh no. Sit there and see what happens. On you go, Mike. Oh, oh. Nothing but curiosity and excitement. Oh, oh. wagging tail. We'll never have problems with her. She's going to be super. When your young dog is working perfectly on retrieving canvas dummies, then you must introduce the sensation of fur or feather tied round the dummy. This introduces the dog to this new material in its mouth and a new smell. Once the dog is working on dummies perfectly, of course, you must introduce the dog to cold game, either a pigeon or a rabbit, killed the day before and allowed to cool, and then as a first introduction, I always put it inside the leg of a woman's stocking, and this cuts down the first sensation of fur or feather in the dog's mouth, particularly with pigeon feathers, which are likely to come off in the dog's mouth and be a slightly unpleasant sensation. Nice retrieve. This little dog is progressing well.
go. 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 Heel. Up until this stage in the young heel. dog's training, although it has heard the word heel, no real serious work has been done to teach him to walk to heel, heel. since this can have the effect of making him ponderous and restricting his flair. Better to leave the introduction of heel work until the dog is more advanced in its general discipline. Heel. Heel. Walk him to heel, first of all on the lead. Then take the lead off and get the dog to walk with the weight of the lead heel. on the back of his neck, giving him the illusion that he is still restricted by the rope. Up. Yeah. Heel. Before gently removing the rope completely. Heel. It must be remembered that the whole temperament and action of the Spaniel differs greatly from that of a Labrador, which one would expect to have a much more precise response from. Blind retrieving with Spaniels is best introduced using either a path or a corridor to help the dog in the initial stages to run straight away from you then what you obviously do is progress longer distances between you and the dog and out into the open field where you obviously would make it more difficult for the dog. But what we are doing here today is introducing the young dog to a blind retrieve of going straight away from the handler. We're going to incorporate into that warm game retrieving with a freshly shot rabbit the young dog is going to run back with any luck and be so enthusiastic because it's that bit further away from the handler, grab the warm game and run straight back. Let's see if it works. As I have said many times, all dog training is a progression of one lesson after another, being carefully blended together as you control and educate your young dog to act correctly under control at all times. If you can gain access to a large rabbit pen, then you can work your young dog under a whole series of controlled conditions 
with all temptations that he might encounter in the shooting field in one place. Here, Mike has sent the young dog on a retrieve in the game pen where there is a high chance that the dog might literally trip over a rabbit. Yet still, he is in the situation of having the dog within the fenced area and therefore under control. Although at all times with a dog, even as well advanced in his training as this one, it would be a silly man indeed who would let his vigilance slip. Now, bringing everything together, you can start to take the dog for short shooting trips. Though it must be emphasized that these exercises are purely for the dog's benefit. And that being so, you must pay strict attention to your dog work at all times. The idea is to get the dog to work to hand and whistle whilst you carry the gun as you move closer to an eventual shooting day. If you do not have the opportunity to shoot live rabbits, then by carefully seeding the ground with a few fresh bodies, you would then shoot in the direction of where you had hidden them, sending the dog on a retrieve. and keep that communication between you and your dog. Never, never take it for granted. In this case, we have the luxury of live rabbits. So therefore, we're looking for a live quarry. There we are, her first fresh retrieve. How rewarding it is to reach this stage with a young dog, when both of you have the future to look forward to. The correct choice of gun dog breed is a decision that every sportsman and woman must make at some time in their lives. And faced with the variety of different breeds and the claims made about them, it's easy to understand how confusion can arise. Popular in both Britain and the United States are the HPR or versatile breeds. 
developed on the continent of Europe where the vast forests housed the sort of game that the sportsmen might find, ranging from wild boar, red deer, pheasants, woodcock, rabbits, a whole variety of game. So the continental sportsmen developed guns that would accommodate everything, known as drillings. They were combinations of shotgun and rifle barrels. The continental sportsmen then developed a dog that would perform the functions of the other breeds, of the pointers, the retrievers and the hunters. And they came up with the HPR. This particular dog here is a German short-haired pointer. Now whilst they perform an excellent function in the field, it must be remembered that they are jacks of all trades and masters of none. They cannot compare as retrievers with Labradors. They cannot compare as hunters with Spaniels or as pointers with English pointers. But they do do an excellent function of all three. However, they are not good first dogs to have. They are unforgiving of mistakes and they do require regular daily work. You cannot expect an HPR to live for weeks in a kennel or in a yard and then go out when you wish to go shooting and immediately click into place and perform its function flawlessly. It won't happen. They require daily, regular work. But if you, your bent is toward this type of dog and you get one of impeccable working breeding, if you train it correctly and, most important, in your choice of gun dog, if you have the sort of facilities to justify this breed, then they can be most rewarding hunting and shooting companions. Most popular of all the gun dogs, of course, are the retrievers, of which there are many varieties. These dogs here are Labrador retrievers, supreme above all other breeds at what they were developed for, retrieving game. Their function is to walk beside the gun and to retrieve game when shot from land in any cover and of course the element in which they absolutely excel is water. Labradors are ideal first dogs. They're very forgiving of inexperience and of mistakes. They make good family pets and temperamentally are a rewarding dog to work with. Once experienced, a retriever can go out only at weekends and will maintain his training in a way which the other breeds never will. Supreme in all the hunting dogs are, of course, the Spaniels, of which there are several varieties ranging from Brittanies to Clumbers. These dogs here are English Springer Spaniels. These dogs were developed in England to flush their way through busying in cover, finding game. If you put one pheasant or one rabbit in a 10-acre field, a spaniel will find it. It will flush it out. It's trained to drop to the flush and then to retrieve it when it is shot. The one problem that must always be kept in mind, however, with spaniels is that they are not comparable with retrievers at retrieving, they cannot do long distance work on retrieving, they are hunting dogs. And in this film I'm going to concentrate on the training of a young English Springer Spaniel and we'll take it through until it's a fully polished working gun dog. The one last consideration that must be made and the most often asked question about gun dogs is what is the best sex to have? There is much nonsense talked about the different abilities of the different sexes. The facts are simply these. There is no difference, whatever, in the working ability of a dog or a bitch. A dog, being physically larger, is subsequently stronger and able to carry a heavier weight a longer distance. However, unless you regularly shoot large numbers of geese. That is not a consideration. Dogs can be slightly harder to train in that they are 
more self-willed than bitches. The disadvantage of bitches is that they come into season, which, if you plan ahead, should never present a problem. The only time that it can be a consideration, and a most annoying one at that, is that if they come into season in the middle of the shooting season, then you really should leave the dog at home unless you wish to encounter problems. However, let us take a young spaniel and progress through his training. By the time your young dog has got to between the ages of seven and nine months, you will want to start his gun dog training proper. Up until this age, you will have concentrated on getting him to walk mannerly on a lead and, of course, to sit, having taught him that by holding his feeding bowl in one hand whilst you push his bottom down with the other. There are two very important foundation stones in gun dog training. The first one is the ability to sit, to sit on command with both your voice, with your hand signal, and with your whistle. The ability to sit on command means that your dog is never going to get itself into trouble. Most people encounter problems in years to come because they have not done this important bang. At distance, drop the dog. And the second of the important foundation stones is the ability to recall the dog from any distance to you. And if you lay this important aspect of the dog's training from the beginning and do not compromise, the rest of your training should be easy. Sit. Now, the hand signal is a straight high arm movement. You never point your arm like that because a dog sees you in silhouette at a distance and he cannot see that but he can see that. So, sit, sit. When you first start moving away from the dog, if he tries to follow you, put him firmly but gently back and sit and go away from the dog. Now the secret of teaching the dog to remain steady is that five out of every six occasions you leave a young dog in a sitting position, you return to the dog. And this means that the dog is never going to anticipate the fact that you may call him and he'll be dashing after you, his bottom off the ground, he'll be unrelaxed. He must lie down, he must sit, he must stay where he is until you call him. And the dog gets used to you walking about, he gets used to you making noise, talking, because he is listening for the signal of his name or the whistle. He'll get used to you flapping your arms about. In other words, the dog sits until it is given a specific command to come to you. There is no need to use the word stay. It's not necessary. Sit means sit until you are commanded to do different. The sitting leads on to the recall, which is leaving the dog. Remember, five out of six times you go away from him, but then you can call him in. Now, calling him in from this distance is simple. Calling him in from a greater distance, he must see your silhouette, and it is that silhouette, his name, or the whistle which we will come to later in his training, or a combination of all three. Leaving the dog sat, remembering that when you're in the field, sit, doing this, Five out of six times, go back, but then when you wish to call the dog in, call him in, get him relaxed and bring him in to you. Only when that is firmly implanted in the dog's training, you can move on to the retrieve. 
Don't assume because he's a spaniel, or indeed because he's a retriever, that he will naturally dash out and bring perfect retrieves every time. Very often they've got to be taught just to retrieve, never mind to do it correctly. So when you introduce the dog to retrieving, ready to restrain him, sit up, ready to restrain him, sit, sit, sit. And the secret sit is again five out of six times get the retrieve yourself and it doesn't matter if it's a retrieve of five yards or 200 yards. Five out of six times get it yourself. The dog must never get the idea into its head that anything that flies through the air or bounces along the ground is its property. Any retrieve the dog is sent for should be regarded by the dog as a privilege, only ever to be allowed on command. So when you're going to finally allow him to go for this, again, you're going to give him a very positive hand signal combined with the command to go forward. Get on. Steady, good boy. Good boy, good boy, good boy, good boy, good boy. Now don't be in too great of a haste to take the dummy out of the dog's mouth. Dead, good boy, good boy. And if your young dog has the slightest tendency to run round you or stop out there, then stand with your back against a wall or a fence. And this should prevent him and encourage him to come in to you. Steady, steady, remember the foundation stones at this stage, sit, go and get the retrieve yourself. A dog has got a very, very short ability to concentrate, 15 to 20 minutes is long enough in any training session. Many people think that the way to train a gun dog is to spend four hours on a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon. Much better to spend 10, 15 or 20 minutes every day. And in every training session, it is very important that you never give the dog more than one or at the most two retrieves. Therefore, the dog will never get the idea that he can dash off and do as he pleases. Leaving him sitting, you've gone and got it, so therefore he's sitting, you can recall him, and you can retrieve. And when your dog is at that stage, and only at that stage, then you can move on to the next part of his training program. Get on. Good boy, good boy, good boy, good boy. Here, 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 here. Sit. Good boy. When your young dog is correctly responding to both your hand and your voice commands to sit and to be recalled, then comes the time you can introduce the dog to the whistle. All gun dog training is not a race, so make sure that each task is firmly learnt before you add anything else to the dog's repertoire. I'm going to introduce the young spaniel to the whistle and then from the whistle I will progress into the natural quartering and hunting of the dog which every spaniel must learn. By making the dog sit in the familiar hand signal command Whilst simultaneously blowing the whistle, the dog learns to sit by association.
If a dog rolls on its back like this, ignore it, then put it back in a sitting position. The reason dogs throw themselves on their backs or lie down is not just laziness. It is subservience and therefore it must be ignored. The technique of making a dog quarter is to walk in a zigzag line, continuously toot tooting on your whistle as the dog reaches the distance where you want it to turn. And by walking in the other direction, you will encourage the dog to run after you. In this fashion, you will make the dog go in a quartering pattern, which with a little practice will become natural. What is of great importance is that before you ever go on to any ground where you're going to teach a young dog to quarter, have walked any game off of the ground before you take the dog onto it. For nothing is more guaranteed to upset a young dog and take his attention immediately away than if a rabbit bursts out in front of him. introduction of your young dog to water is one which must always be taken with the greatest seriousness. Don't ever assume that because your young dog is a gun dog he will naturally jump in and swim away. Some do and some, as we'll see in a moment, this young dog has never been in water. Some of them take to it like ducks and some of them need to be taught to swim and find out about this new environment. So, Put your rubber boots on, let him get his feet wet, and make it a gentle experience. Now look, that little dog, he's as happy as Larry. There we are. What are you going to do? There we are. Go on. Pick a warm day, a time of the year when the water temperature is not too cold so that the dog's first experience in this new element is is pleasant now i'm going to try and get the little dog to swim he may naturally swim away and he may naturally struggle with his four feet up and his bottom down but he'll soon learn go on look at that wonderful here we are there we are. Perfect. Perfect. Good boy. Good boy. Here, see, see, see. Good boy. Now that's a bold spaniel. A good spaniel. Good boy. And remember, never try to take the dummy too quickly. Let the dog hold it. If it's a runner, good boy. If it's a runner, a wounded bird, you never want that that, that that you never want that dog putting the duck or the pheasant or whatever down before you take it. Let's try one more. See? Sit there now. Good boy, sit. Sit. Good boy, sit. Go on. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Bring it here. Bring it here. Bring it here. Dead. Dead. Good. Now that was absolutely flawless and, and painless for the dog. And if every introduction to water was that easy, gun dog training would be a great deal easier. The last one for luck. See? Eh? 
And that's one little dog that will never ever have problems with his water work. Good boy. Good boy. Dead. That's, 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 that's. The introduction of your young dog to the furred and feathered dummy is one which should always be done first thing in the morning when the dog is fresh and he hasn't had any other work or retrieves that day. He's familiar with the standard canvas dummy. He's now going to get the experience of this new texture in his mouth. You can use either bird's wings, in this case hen pheasant's wings, and of course a rabbit skin. The technique is simple. First of all, you throw out the canvas dummy. And the instant the dog has retrieved the canvas dummy, I'm going to throw this out and he'll be out and should have it in his mouth without realizing that there is any difference whatever. Get on. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good wee boy. Good wee boy. Dead. And... Get on. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy, dead. As simple as that, the dog doesn't realize there's been any difference take place, and from now on, I'll alternate the canvas dummy, the feathered dummy, and the rabbit skin dummy, and eventually we'll move on to cold game. Good boy. The introduction of your young dog to shot is something that should never be taken too lightly. Never go out with a shotgun and go up behind a young, unsuspecting dog and fire a shot to see what the results might be. Always approach the introduction with caution. I'm sitting here in the sunshine, stroking the dog, and the dog is half asleep in the heat. What he doesn't realize is that my companion up the hill has a pistol, and on a signal from me, she will fire a shot at that distance, the noise should be in no way threatening. And then, progressively as she comes closer and fires more shots, I will be here with the dog to comfort him if he shows the slightest alarm. And if he shows any serious alarm, then we'll just stop and start again another day. What was that, a bang, hmm? Was that a bang, hmm? The dog indeed has hardly registered the fact that there was a bang at all. This is a task that is so simple if done correctly and yet so many people Get it completely wrong. Oh, bang. Hmm? There we are. Could you come closer? And we'll try one more. From there. There we are. Thank you. It's a good boy. When your young dog has been introduced to the sound of shot and has started to quarter, now is the time when you start to put all the individual lessons together, working toward the finished dog. What I am doing here is quartering the dog and stopping him on the familiar hand signal to stop and at the same time firing a starting pistol. Like all other aspects of gun dog training, a dog learns by association. It is the hand signal, aided by the whistle, that makes him stop. And he associates the sound of the pistol by the action of sitting. And in that way, we are going to teach the dog to drop to shot. Added to this task 
you of course throw a dummy going out and getting it yourself this teaches the dog and enforces steadiness into him Then, as you cast him into his pattern, fire the pistol occasionally, compelling the dog to stop, and aiding him with the stop and the whistle when you throw the dummy. Then give him just a little moment or two of pause before you cast him on. The whole secret of this lesson is to continuously vary the order that the commands are given to the dog. And the idea is that the dog then keeps his attention on you and doesn't at any time have the opportunity to double guess what you're going to do, to think he knows what's coming next. That's when you begin to invite problems. Occasionally, of course, you must give the dog a retrieve. This is what keeps the dog fresh and keeps his attention on you. But for all this quartering and dropping to shot and occasional retrieving, remember it is variation that is the secret. And quietly. There is no need ever to blast the whistle, shout at the dog. It's a whole technique of quietly practicing your communication with the dog so that the two of you learn to work as a team. And it is practice on a regular basis that will bring this. That's what will achieve the team effort. You. As your young dog is learning the skills of retrieving, we must start to give him directional guidance. Otherwise, in the future, you'll never be able to direct him onto a specific point. Now, there are two straight lines always going to meet on any one spot. Sit. Up. sit. If you can sit, compel your dog to go in a straight line in front of you, then a straight line to one side, you'll always be in a position where you can put your dog exactly where you want it to be. And this is easily done by using a wall or a fence. You throw a dummy to one side and standing in front of the dog, and obviously as you progress through this particular lesson, you put yourself further and progressively further from the dog with a big hand movement, command the dog on. Get on. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Dead. The idea of using the fence... Hi, 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 hi. Sit. Up. The idea of using the fence is that you give the dog always one side of a parallel line on which to run. You then progress to two retreats. And it is important that you always send the dog for the first one you threw. The last one you threw is most immediate in the dog's mind and the one the dog would naturally want to go for. So always send it for the first one. Get on. Good boy. And whilst the dog may well remember where the other one is and be enthusiastic to go for it, get it yourself. Remember the golden rule. A gun dog is learning more by sitting under control and watching the activity 
than he is ever going to learn by dashing headlong for the fun of a retrieve. The whole secret of going straight away from you is done with the fence as well. Throwing a dummy on the other side of the dog so that when you do give the dog the hand signal, it is straight up, remembering silhouettes. If it was to the right, it's like that. Left, it's like that. And straight away, for go back, is straight above your head. Go back. Get on. Good boy, good boy, good boy, good boy, steady, hey, hey, good boy, sit, no, sit, ringing the changes, hat, ringing the changes all the time, never ever let the dog get the idea that he can double guess you. The instance here where the dog has wanted to go for that one is a perfect example. I'm going to send him for that one. In other words, the one that he does not expect. Steady. Good boy. Good boy. Steady. Ha <laughs> ha. Dead. And remember, always pick the other one yourself. It's a good boy. As your training schedule progresses, you will have by now taught your young dog all the individual constituent parts that come toward making a gun dog. You then come to the, the day when you must start flowing everything together so that the dog is in all regards a trained gun dog. This is Morris. Morris is a, a classic English Springer Spaniel, physically and mentally capable of doing any of the tasks that might be required of him in the shooting field. Let's watch Morris and his handler, Mike Thomas. The problem encountered by most Spaniel trainers is that they tend to take their dogs for granted, never spending sufficient time in the constant practice and maintenance of the dog's training. And here you see the classic example of how a good dog can be kept at a highly polished level. A fast driving dog like Morris could easily, quickly, take over his handler and run further and further progressively as his pattern ever widened. The whole secret of how Mike Thomas continues to keep this high polish with his dog is by constant practice. Only a silly man would, when he thought his dog was trained, leave it in a kennel and then go out on an occasional weekend for a quick burst of training. Notice how the dog's nose is working the ground, and yet his response whenever the shot goes off is instant. It is this very quality in a spaniel that tends to make them difficult for the amateur handler who has a sloppy technique in his training. If taken correctly, the spaniel is a most wonderful companion, 
but if taken incorrectly, a spaniel can quickly become a nightmare. So therefore, to avoid this sort of thing happening, one must simply continue practicing with you and your dog and his skills. The dog will quarter, searching the ground, his nose always busy, and notice how distinctly quiet and direct the handler is with the dog, talking to it with the whistle, and the whistle is quiet. The intelligent use of the ground confirmation combined with the use of the dummy launcher beautifully illustrates a split retrieve. Blind retrieves are something which should always be well thought out. It's a very windy day here. We've come to an area on top of a mountain. The reason we use the wind, as we have seen in the past training, is to help the dog. I've put two dummies out here on the hill. Neither Mike nor Morris the dog know where they are. All I've given Mike as a clue is I've told him one is at 10 o'clock and one is at 2 o'clock. Let's watch how he and the dog together do that retrieve. Now that was a relatively easy retrieve. The dog running down the wind, the scent immediately bringing the location of the dummy straight to the dog. And now for the second one. But because the wind is in a slightly different direction, the dog is requiring handling onto it. But even here, his response to the handler, his communication with the handler is good. Now the dog has a line on it. You can see from the dog, ah, you can see he's got it. You can see from a dog's reaction, if you watch and become familiar with him, with your dog's movement, as to what he's finding with his nose. That was nice. The technique of introducing your young dog to cold game is exactly the same as when you've put your dog from canvas onto furred and feathered dummies. A rabbit, or indeed a bird, out of the deep freeze, thawed out overnight, and we follow the same technique of throwing one dummy... Get on! Good boy! Good boy! Good boy! Good boy. Good boy. Dead. S S Get on. Good boy. Good boy. Come on. Pick it up. Come on. Come on. Good boy. Come on. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. There we are. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. And that was his first introduction to cold game. 
and now gently increase it throughout his training and eventually it shouldn't mean anything to him at all. But do remember that it is up until this stage the dog has never and should never have found or met or associated dead game with himself. Good boy. The pheasant and rabbit pen is vital in all gun dog training since it is this area in here that you teach the dog not to chase game. A dog which flushes game and then regards it as a signal to run after it is of no use to anyone. I'm going to take the young dog over here and make him sit and see if I can keep the control and prevent the dog in any way being tempted to peg one of these birds. Come on. Come on. At all times when you're moving about in the pheasant pen, it is essential to try and prevent the dog from getting excited. This young dog has been in here before. Sit. My whistle always at ready to stop him from chasing. This young dog has been in here before. Initially, when he was first brought in, he was tied and disallowed from the slightest temptation to chase. After he has regarded the fact that he cannot chase these birds, then we'll take him out of this area and we'll start to familiarize him with flushing and dropping. You're a good boy. You're a good boy. Let's go a little bit closer. Come on. Come on, it's a good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Here. Yeah. No, he's a good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Come on. Sit. Hop. Hop. Down in there. Sit there. Sit there. Sit, sit, no, sit. Keep in control with the dog at all times. No, no. Good, that was good. And now we come to the final part of the gun dog's training, when we start to simulate a day's shooting. I've laid out cold game taken out of the freezer last night and thawed and I've put it on typical game holding ground. Mike knows where it is, the dog does not. And what we're going to do is bring all the training together now as a final polish before we actually go shooting. The dog will quarter, it will drop to shot, it will remain steady if it flushes any game. A whole practice, a rehearsal, making it as close as we possibly can to a day's shooting. In this way, we polish and we refine and it pays results in the end. As the dog quarters, hunting his way through cover, steady to any game that might be put up by the dog, he does not know when the gun is meant to be fired. And then, when it is fired, he has to be handled out through a veritable supermarket of sense, communicating with his handler until the handler has worked him into the area of the retrieve. And this is where the results of your long months of whistle and handwork with your dog will be found out. This is the truth. The telling point is now.
And there he is. He's got it. A nice straight retrieve. Sits nicely. And the rabbit in the bag. Notice that everything is at the sort of speed one would have in the field. Nothing is hurried, and this is so important. They are casting the dog in a different direction, working the dog exactly as one would during the shooting season. Ready to shoot at any game that might be pushed out by the dog, watching the dog as he works his cover. There are two types of men that own dogs. The shooting man, who wants a dog as a tool, and the dog handler who shoots. I always think that spaniels are the ideal type of dog for the dog handler who shoots, because only that sort of man gets the sort of excitement from this vibrant breed. The dog has picked his second retrieve nicely. It's into the bag, and you'll notice that Mike, even when he is shooting on his own, is sensible and cautious enough to have his gun broken when he is not actually ready to shoot. Safety should always be a consideration. This, of course, is the sort of country that is ideal for Spaniels. Working away. And he's hit the scent. Taking, changing his grip, good. Balancing it, and uphill nicely. And there we are. And that is the result of months of hard, rewarding work. A dog which is now ready to face a life as a gun dog and bring many years of great pleasure to both himself and his handler. As you have seen, there is no mystery in training a gun dog. It's purely a case of teaching the dog on a gentle formula through each stage and not trying to go too fast. It is not, as I have said, a race. Take your time, work hard with your dog, and in years to come you will enjoy a wonderful and enthusiastic hunting and shooting companion.